weekend, this weekend, celebrating Memorial Day is a well-deserved occasion. One of the um, one of the greatest deterrents to war is a strong military, and we have a strong military, and there are many who have given their lives in order to demonstrate that, and we want to express our appreciation and acknowledge uh, them here today. I know that many of you perhaps have uh, lost loved ones, uh, lost friends uh, to to um, the war, and we certainly want to acknowledge uh, what they have done for us. What beautiful worship today, huh? Uh, a glorious time to be able to come into the presence presence of the Lord. We're so appreciative of these who lead us into the throne room. We're going to be talking about uh, the throne room today. We're going to, uh, we want to get up into heaven and see what's going to, what's in store for us. But let me open in a word of prayer as we get started. Heavenly Father, we just want to tell you as your people, we want to tell you we love you. Those watching online, those here in the worship center, all together, we come as we open your word and we ask that you would speak to us, that you speak to us each individually, that you would speak to us as, as your bride, the church, and that we'd recognize uh, your presence here in this place. Holy Spirit, saturate us with your presence, we pray. We pray that you'd envelop this place with your presence here today and that you'd capture our minds, that you'd give us the understanding, that you'd give us a vision of what is to come. And I pray that you'd use your word to do that, Lord, in each one of our hearts. I bind any demonic spirit from this place today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak only to our lives. And I pray that, and that you'd use me as well. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. If you came in, you uh, hopefully you picked up one of these um, note sheets. And if you didn't, you're welcome to go back to one of the tables and pick it up. Because on the back, we had that diagram that we talked about last week. Maybe some of you weren't here last week. And so you really, I, wa- I really want you to see the whole picture. But um, keep that up there for just a minute, second. And then we'll go to each um, of them individually. But we looked at the timeline, the plan of the end. And there's the Old Testament period. There's the church age that we'll talk about in a minute. Here's the rapture. Then the tribulation occurs, then the thousand-year kingdom age. We see Satan is down in prison. He's been locked up for a thousand years there. He'll be loosed. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Then the great white throne judgment where those who are, whose names are not written in the book, Lamb's Book of Life are uh, come before Jesus to be judged for their sin. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth. We see the lake of fire. Um, and uh, let, let's, let's, let's go to each of these individually so we can look at them. We see the Old Testament, Old Testament here. You see Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, where the church began, the first mention of the church. The Holy Spirit comes down. We have the church age. This is the age of grace. This is where we have the opportunity. We are the church, and this is our opportunity to be a part of the bride. The bride is the church. Uh, Jesus is, is grooming the bride to rule and reign with him throughout all eternity. And then at the end of the church age, and you know those little, um, those little um, maps in the mall, and you look at it, and it says you are here. I think we would put that dot right about there maybe. Uh, you are here. We're getting ready. We're going to go up in the rapture in the, in the twinkling of an eye in, in uh, uh, just a, one, uh, a 42nd thousandth of a second. We're going to be taken up to meet the Lord in the air, so there will be the rapture of the church. And then immediately following the rapture, we have the tribulation period that begins. This is where the Antichrist shows up. He may be alive today. Uh, it's a seven-year period under the rule of the Antichrist. There will be such devastation on the earth that such has never been known before on the earth. The second three, three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation is going to be the horrible wrath of God, which, is, which, which will be a horrible time uh, for those who are left on the earth. There will be those who will want to die, and they won't be able to. Then at the end of that, all the armies are going to r- rally against um, against. Uh, the, the Jewish people, Jerusalem, Israel, and uh, in the battle of Armageddon, Jesus is going to come down with his army from heaven. We're all going to be riding white horses dressed in white. God's going to uh, smite the armies and establish his kingdom. Okay, so we go to the millennial kingdom, uh, which is coming up right. No, let's go back up into heaven for just a moment. Uh, During the tribulation period, we go back up into heaven, and there's something going on while we're in heaven, and that's the judgment seat of Christ. Let's go back to that, if you would. The judgment seat of Christ, and that is where we're not going to be judged for our sin there because sin condemns. Our sin has been paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're at the the judgment seat of Christ, 
we're going to heaven, all right? You're going to heaven, but you're going to be judged for the works that you did, for the kingdom, for the benefit to the kingdom while you were here on the earth. And then during that, there's going to be, there's going to be a reward ceremony. We talked about the five crowns. There may be other rewards that aren't mentioned. Uh, believers will be judged for their kingdom works. And then um, at, after that time, we're going to see the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, the union of Jesus and the church, uh, the Old Testament saints are invited. The Old Testament saints aren't a part of the church. Uh, they, they are before the church age, but the church age is to groom and develop a bride for Christ to rule and reign throughout all eternity. So the Old Testament saints will be invited to that wedding ceremony. But let's go back down to uh, the earth. There's a kingdom age. When Jesus comes back, um, the second time, and smites the armies there in the Valley of Megiddo where uh, during, the valley, val- uh, during the Battle of Armageddon, when he comes back down, he will set up, after, after those uh, armies have been um, destroyed, he's going to set up a thousand-year period called, uh, it's an age of peace, it's the kingdom age, it's the millennial kingdom, and uh, Satan will be in prison during this time. Uh, there will be uh, a time of peace where uh, Jesus will rule and reign, reign out of Jerusalem. Now, at the end of that kingdom age, uh, after that thousand years, Satan will be released, and then uh, he's going to come rally, rally um, troops from four corners of the earth from different nations. They're going to they're going to attack the kingdom of God, this this kingdom of peace, the millennial kingdom, and they're going to be annihilated by. And then at that point, Satan's going to be thrown into the lake of fire, and he will be seen no more. No more Satan ever, 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 ever. So he's going to be gone for good, and then we see the great white throne uh, judgment, which uh, the, um, the, those who are without Christ, whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, will go to the great white throne judgment. They'll be judged for their sin. Their sin condemns them. They will also be thrown into the lake of fire along with Satan and those demonic spirits. So we will see uh, that that's what is in store for those who are without Christ. Christ has given us a, an opportunity. He's uh, through his blood. He shed for us, giving us the opportunity. I want you to inherit eternal life. I want you to experience this. But we can't have that which is uh, unconfessed sin um, uh, in, in the, into heaven. So the books are open at the, at, the, um, at the great white throne judgment. If your name is not written on the Lamb's book of life, then you will be thrown into the lake of fire. So then we go to a new heaven and new earth. This is what we're going to talk about today. This is really exciting, and you're going to have to use your sanctified imagination, okay, because just I'm going to try to keep it up here, but studying this, it is, it's intriguing. It's difficult. Uh, some of it's difficult to understand, but we're going to go, we're going to experience something that I'm, if, if you're saved, if you're a born-again believer, this is something that we are actually going to see you're going to experience. It's going to be real to you. It's hard for you to understand, us to understand on this side of eternity because we're limited to the physical. But there's a spiritual dimension that is beautiful. Jesus is working on that. But the old, the old earth is going to be destroyed. The new heaven and earth will be created. The new Jerusalem will descend out of heaven, and our eternal home will be with Jesus. So let's, let's go, um, let's, let's, uh, let's move on. And, you know, when we, when we um, talk about We talk about all, we're always teaching about what we need to do and what we need to be and what Christ wants us to be and we want to be more like Christ. But uh, while this is going on, Jesus is is getting something ready for us. And this is something that we are all going to experience. But this, I want to introduce the most exciting reality for us to look forward to. And this is the end of the millennium, the beginning of the perfect, glorious, holy existence with Jesus in our new glorified bodies. We're going to have new bodies, thank the Lord. And we are now dealing with an eternal state that is going to last forever and ever. It's never going to end. And if we as humans could only wrap our minds around this, I'll tell you what, this eternal state that we're talking about today, if we could just wrap our minds around it, we wouldn't be afraid of death at all. We, death would, uh, we, we would certainly look forward to it. So what do we have to look forward to? Well, let's, I'm going to list several things for you today. Well, first of all is the new creations. And in Revelation chapters 21 and 22, John did his best to describe what he was seeing. Now, we're in the last part of Revelation. This is where it comes in for a landing. And so we want to see what is coming, what's going to be real, what is Jesus doing, and what we're going to try to, try to imagine what it exactly is going to look like. But in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 2, uh, John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, in verses 9 and 10, we see that John was invited to a guided tour of that city by one of the angels that came down. We read, starting in verse 9, then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came and said to me, come with me and I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And so he took me in the spirit, sending out of heaven from God. But why was there a new heaven and a new earth? What happened to this one? What happened to the one that we know right now? Well, it's going to blow up. It's going to burn up. You're talking about global warming. It's going to be global melting uh, that that is going to take place on the earth. The earth is going to disappear. Second Peter, Peter helps us to understand that in second Peter chapter three, as he says, but one, uh, but the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he'll set the heavens on fire, and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth he has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. Now, the first time that God brought judgment on the earth, he, he uh, was with water, the flood. This time it'll be with fire. God has stored the elements of the earth with fire. In the atomic nature of the universe, everything has a molecular, a molecular fire in it. And so the atmosphere is stored with fire. The earth has a molten core And one of these days, God is going to unleash that energy that he holds uh, together by his mighty power, and the atmospheric heaven and the earth will dissolve under this. They're going to melt. It's going to be incinerated. All traces of sin that once existed on the earth will be gone. Anything that has anything to do with the deterioration of of sin, sin uh, on on the earth is going to be gone. All evil is going to be burned up. Now, we learn in the Scripture that there are actually three heavens. The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven where the birds fly. The second is the planetary heaven where the galaxies are. And then the third would be the throne of God. This is the third heaven where Paul mentions that he went up to the third heaven, whether it was in body or in spirit, he went up to the third heaven. But it's the atmospheric heaven that he's talking about here, where the birds fly that passes away in this passage. Now, imagine the purity Imagine the purity of this new heaven and new earth. This world is beautiful, right? I mean, especially here in Western North Carolina, um, with even with all the sin in it, we have this beautiful, uh, the beautiful mountains of Western uh, North Carolina. Um, but think about what this new one is going to look like. If he's going to improve it, and anything that deteriorates is going to be burned up, it's going to be gone. Think about what this new one is going to look like. So then, descri- then, then John describes another spectacular event, and that is the new Jerusalem. Um, verse 2 of chapter 21 says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now that sounds a little weird, doesn't it? The city Is the city going to be the bride? No. Uh, is, he's talking about the people who live in that city. And I can illustrate that by saying, hey, you know, uh, Asheville is a, Western North Carolina, Asheville is a beautiful city, right? Um, but then I can also say Asheville is a, a friendly place with a lot of weird in it um, as well. So first I'm talking about the city, the place, and then I'm talking about the people in the place, and that's what John is talking about uh, here as he's talking this, the people in the place. That's what God, um, it, it, the, he's preparing a bride adorned for her husband. That magnificent city is not the wife of the lamb until Jesus brings her across the threshold uh, into that eternal city of gold. So this is the, the new Jerusalem that Jesus promised 
that he would prepare for the bride. And so we go on to, to John chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in, also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? So that is taking place right now. Now, you know, at over 2,000 years ago, um, Jesus said this. And can you imagine what that is going to look like? Can you imagine what heaven is going to look like? Can you imagine that place where you and I are going to live is going to look like? So let's talk about the unimaginable heaven. The new Jerusalem is in heaven. It's not all of heaven, but it is in heaven because John says it was coming down from heaven Heaven will be such an amazing place because Jesus will be there in all his glory. And remember the prayer that back in John chapter 17, if you want to hear Jesus pray for you, go back and read John chapter 17. Because it's the prayer that Jesus is praying for his disciples. And then he says, you know, for those who come later on, I'm praying for them as well. But he says in John chapter 17, as he's praying, he says, Father, listen, I, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory that you've given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. See, in the Old Testament, God dwelt in the tabernacle. That's where, that's where God, the presence of God was. And, uh, um, but now here in this, in this new place, he'll be with his people. He will dwell with his people. We no longer have to pray our Father who art in heaven, but we will know that he is actually there with us. We're in his presence. We're able to see him. We're able to worship him. We're able to feel him and, and to experience his glory. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 8, John says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they'll be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down so what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give you freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all of uh, these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards and unbelievers, the corrupt, the murderers, the immoral, those who practice witch, witchcraft, idol worship, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. That's Jesus talking. That's a quote from, from the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've all experienced brokenness while we're here on this old earth of ours, this deteriorating earth uh, in our deteriorating bodies. But we've all experienced brokenness, which brings tears. It brings sorrow. It brings pain. Um, maybe it's the abandonment by people, the abandonment of friends, betrayal of friends, hurt by our children, uh, hurt by your parents, dreams dashed on the rocks, sickness, anxiety, worry, depression, on and on we could go. Job says in Job chapter seven, five, 5, verse 7, he says, people are born for trouble as readily as the sparks fly up from a fire. But there's coming a time, there's coming a time where there will be no more crying, no more broken dreams, no more hurt hearts, no more funerals, no more disease, no more strongholds, no more addictions, no more hospitals, no more therapists. So if you're a doctor, you're going to have to get a new, new job when you get to heaven, all right? Because there's not going to be a need for the doctors or the therapists or sickness or hospitals. Um, these are all going to burn up like the old earth did. And I'm tell you what, I'm looking forward to that. Every, it's going to be a utopian existence, a utopia. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, forever. And then we'll look at the splendor of the city. The structure and the materials of the city are like something we've never seen. Now, John is necessarily forced to try to uh, use a language of comparison. And he's struggling because what he sees here perhaps is 
indescribable. And so he's using that language of comparison because what he's trying to describe in human language seems so inadequate. He tries to describe the gates. He says the city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. And the name of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. And there were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. And there's an angel serving as sentinels at each, at, at each gate, uh, securing the entrance to that gate. And in verse 21, he says that each of the 12 gates were made. Now, get this. Each of the 12 gates were uh, made from a single pearl. And the main street was made of pure gold. It only mentions one street. And so I think we're all going to live on Main Street. We're, all gonna ha- we're not going to live in different neighborhoods. We're all going to live on Main Street. But he says Main Street was made of pure gold, but it was a gold as clear as glass. It's so pure. Then he gives the measurements of the city. He says in verse 15, the angel who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. When he measured it, he found that it was a square, as wide as it was long. In fact, its length, width, and height were each 1,400 miles. Then he measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick. So the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven is a perfect cube. It is a perfect cube. 1,400 miles high, long, wide, deep, and it is, it is, now, now let me, let's get this right, okay, the, the city of Jerusalem, this new Jerusalem is coming down from heaven, it's not touching the earth, there's a new earth, a new heaven, but this, this, this cube, perfect cube of a city comes down, it's, it's hanging in the atmosphere, and um, it hangs there, hangs there above the earth. It doesn't say that it actually touches the earth. Now, to give, you, give a perspective, the highest point on earth is about 5,000 miles, and that's Mount Everest, approximately 5,000 miles high. We're talking about 1,400 miles high, this city, perfect cube, um, 1,400 miles high. One commentator figured that the city would contain 2.5 million square miles. That's going to be plenty of space for all of God's redeemed children. In fact, there will be enough room for, he figures, 100 billion people and each of us are able to have our own horse ranch. So we can all, all have a ranch because we're going to ride horses out of heaven, right, uh, when Jesus comes and, and smites the armies that have gathered against Israel. So I'm going to see if I can keep mine. Um, but, we, but listen, we're going to be able to transport from, as the redeemed, the gates are always going to be open. I'll get to that in a minute. The gates are always going to be open, so, and there will be no night, so we can come and go as we please. And we'll be able to transport to the earth. We'll be able to go into the city. All of those who are redeemed. Let me move on. All of these details represent a perfect city with perfect dimensions. You know, in, in, God's, in God's instruction for the temple, he calls for the Holy Holies to be a perfect cube. And this was the place where God's presence dwelt. Well, isn't it wonderful that our living place will be as the Holy of Holies? We will be there experiencing God. The Bible says that there will be no temple there. Jesus will be the temple because we, there will be uh, constant worship and praise everywhere. Now, as I said, Jesus will, will make sure that we have complete liberty to come and go anywhere any time. Um, Revelation 21, 25 says, its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there is no night there. Hey, did I sh- bring that picture back up? Did I show that picture? This is, the, this is uh, somebody's rendering of that new Jerusalem hanging above the earth there in the atmosphere, this new Jerusalem, and this is where the people of God, the redeemed, are going to live. If you look up that new Jerusalem, uh, there's all kinds of renderings and, and pictures of it, but I, I like this because it is the perfect cube, and that is the dimensions that were given. But Jesus will ensure also the purity of the place. No evil will ever enter. 
Uh, no one will be in heaven except those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Nothing profane will, ne- will ever enter those gates. Revelation 22, 17 sa- tells us that heaven is going to be a place of satisfaction as well. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Let everyone who hears say, come. Let everyone who is thirsty, come. Let every, anyone who desires drink freely, f- drink freely from the water of life. And this means that our deepest needs are going to be met. Our needs are going to be met there. Every God-given thirst will be satisfied in heaven. A young man came up to me last week after we talked about this, and he says, will there still be hunting in heaven? I said, I don't know, man. I, I, I can't go there. I can't answer that. But, and, and because the trees of heaven will, will have the ever-ripening fruit for the healing of the nations, the glow of health is going to be on every one of us. So there'll be no more cancer, no more sickness, um, and we're going to be no more heart problems, and we're going to be able to eat as, many, as much ice cream and, um, and french fries as we want. Crispy, crispy french fries. Revelation 22 reminds us that heaven will be a place of service. Now, this is interesting to me in verse 3. It says, no longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. So we, we're going to have an opportunity to serve God in ways that we don't have here. We're going to have an opportunity to, to take position of service in, in heaven. God has his plans for us when we get to heaven, and it's probably going to be us using the gifts, the spiritual gifts that God has given to us, maybe the role that you've played in, in caring for his bride would be a role that you are being prepared for when you get to heaven. Maybe the spiritual gifts, which are the supernatural gifts given to believers. When we invite Christ to come into our life, they are supernatural gifts that are for the building up of the church. Those would be, I can't imagine that those are going to dissipate. I imagine that we're practicing here and those gifts are going to be accentuated when we get to heaven because of the care that we have given, the ministry, the role that we have given, the support that we have given to his bride, the church. The colors in heaven are going to be amazing. All the stones uh, named are exquisite colors. Um, The the city is built on a foundation inlaid with 12 precious stones. You can look these up, and they're absolutely beautiful, but they're going to be so pure. Verses 18 through 20, the wall was made of jasper, and the city was pure gold, as clear as glass, The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones. The first was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third was agate, the fourth was emerald, the fifth was onyx, the sixth uh, carnelian, Um, the seventh was uh, chrysolite, the eighth was beryl, the ninth was topaz, the tenth was chrysoprase, chrysoprase. Chrysoprase, I don't know if I'm pronouncing those right, and the 11th is Jazinth, the 12th was Amethyst. So um, listen, we're, we're going to see all of this one day. We're going to be dazzled, amazed, enthralled by what we see in heaven. It's indescribable. Verse 6 of chapter 22, and the angel said to me, everything you've heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires his prophets, has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. In the following verses, Jesus steps forward and he follows that up saying, in verse 7, look, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. Look, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. He was was a faithful witness to all of these things, says, yes, I'm coming soon. It looks like John says, amen, come Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. That's the last warning in the Bible. 
<coughs> excuse me, that's the last one in the Bible. That's the alert. Take heed. Jesus is saying, behold, I'm coming soon. Take heed, lest it be today, lest it be tomorrow. Entrance into the eternal city is by invitation only. Only those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, who've repented of their sin, inviting Jesus Christ to come into their life, acknowledging him as their Savior and Lord, will be able to enter into that city. And listen, I can get you on that invitation list. If you'll come to me at the end of the service, I can help you to make sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're on that invitation list and that decision has to be made on this side of eternity. It's too late when you cross over. God gives you the opportunity here. You have the opportunity to either accept him, receive him, or reject him. It's a choice that we make on this side. The bottom line here is that heaven will be a, gl uh, a glorious forever experience for every child, and it will never end. It'll never change. What a wonderful climax to God's prophetic calendar to know that forever and ever that he's going to present us with a new heaven, a new earth, and we'll live there forever and ever. And we, we get to trade in these old deteriorating bodies for a body like Jesus. We'll have perfect bodies, immortal bodies. We'll recognize each other, incorruptible bodies. But the best thing about heaven is our personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Scripture says right now we see through a glass darkly. It's blurry. But one day we'll see him face to face. You'll look in his eyes. And we're going to experience this glorious new Jerusalem, this glorious splendor of heaven. Never night, but in the presence of the Lord. The, you know, the streets and the mansions are incidental. Only to be with Jesus is the best part. Be able to see him face to face. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope that you've given to us. We don't have to work to be perfect, to be able to qualify. You've made a way for us. All we have to do is cross that bridge. And I pray that for each and every one of us, first of all, for those who are born-again Christians, I pray, Father, that these words that I've spoken today are energizing, are inspiring, are encouraging, are exciting, that they would be, bring peace as we deteriorate in these bodies that we're in, as we experience a deteriorating earth, knowing that you're going to make all things new. You're going to make everything new. Lord, I pray that that would be an encouragement to your children. But Lord, if there are those who um, need to straighten up and to anticipate your coming soon, then I pray, Father, that you put that on their heart as well. Give them the courage to do that. If there are those who are listening to me, whether it's online, whether it's here in this worship center, who don't know you as their personal Savior and Lord, my prayer is that your words that I've spoken today, that I've read, read from your, your word today, would pierce their heart, that the guard would come down, that they would see and acknowledge your love. 